Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming uh, and welcome. So, my talk today uh, is about more about me sharing my experiences where work, working as a publisher and dealing with smaller game development studios. Uh, the talk will be focused on uh, or more skewed towards free free games, and uh, so yeah, I'm just going to start. So. Um, one of the big questions, uh, one of the big uh, misconceptions uh, about monetization, right, is who is responsible for monetization? Now, traditionally, our, our game designers are responsible for creating fun, and the commercial or marketing teams would be focused on monetization. But in today's free landscape, uh, that's kind of change. Uh, monetization is still a function of uh, of uh, marketing or commercial when it's a paid game. But for a free game, uh, monetization is really a function of game design. So yeah, let's, let's look at it from a design perspective. So why is, why is monetization important for design? So when does a player make, when does a player make a uh, purchase in the game? Uh, they play while they're experiencing it and so the point, of, the point of sales for a game happens when the player is playing the game. And who, has the, you know, who communicates to the player at this point of time? It's typically uh, a game designer's indirect communication or a live ops team's communication. So, and the live ops can only do their jobs if the game design team has provided the right tools to the live ops teams to do. Now, another, another thing that uh, we want to get uh, monetization into your game design early in the stage is because of costly changes later in the production cycle. So one of the very common problems as a publisher when I worked with smaller teams was that uh, uh, a lot of developers would come up and you know they'd be like 12 months into the game and yeah we've got this cool game and and most of the time we probably sign them up and sometimes even do a beta test with them. And when the feedback comes uh, comes back, the metrics are you know not up to standards or not up, you know, um, not good enough. So uh, we have, at this point in time, we have to make uh, some kind of uh, decisions on how to move forward. And most of the time, we probably end up compromising or having to spend months re-architecting the product or abandon the project in, some, in certain cases. So all three choices are fairly costly. So the idea is right. We want to bring monetization early on. You know, we think about input methods and we think about teams and and designs at early stage of the game. But why not think about monetization as well? Uh, so have someone in the team right to pay attention to monetization early. Now, I, ideally, I think these people, this kind of person, should be you know a generalist in game design, have some ideas about marketing, and statistically inclined. So, what do we sell uh, in a in a free game? Now, in almost any game I can think of, uh, there is uh, a stage and a set of tools for the player to interact with that stage. Um, and players are interested in buying what is valuable. And so, what it, what is valuable actually? Now, an example of tools that. Uh, in a game, uh, things like characters and cars and buildings, even for city building games. Uh, and the thing that people are most attached to, to buying are really persistent tools, uh, the tools that the player would use uh, to, uh, to play in the game. So don't focus on selling stages and stuff. I, I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of uh, developers I've talked to that you know, they like to sell level packs and stuff. So I'll, I'll talk about this a bit, about, uh, a bit more later on. So the idea is really to focus on, on things that you want to sell, which is focus on valuable stuff. You know, so build a, build as many tools for the player so that you have as many things, so you have a lot of things to sell. And throughout the years, uh, some of the biggest revenue, in fact, almost every uh, online game that I've launched, uh, the biggest revenue generators were basically stuff that would advance or progress the players right towards uh, acquiring these tools. So focus on investments and ensure that there is a persistent 
uh, goal for those tools at the end of the day. So now, how do we sell them, actually? Um, and the idea here really is to break this stuff, break your tools up into as many parts as possible. Um, it's, it's not as hard as you think it is. Uh, a, lot, a lot of developers believe that it's going to be a lot of content to make. Um, but if you, if you decide you know, to focus on figuring out how you can break down that process of acquiring tools, right, uh, you will have a lot of different things to sell. So we don't, we don't ever want to sell tools directly to the player because that uh, immediately uh, uh, stops their, their desire for, to move forward, actually. And let everyone earn these tools. And when you break those tools down, ensure that they have some form of utility because we want to ensure that the games, that, this, that the, the acquisition of these tools are still fun. So when you give them utility, you are able to make players make decisions on them. You're able to let players master skills with using them. And once you've even acquired those tools, allow the players to upgrade and customize those tools further on. So let's, I mean, a typical scenario would be things like a, you know, like a character, for instance. You know, so the character is the tool. And if you break it down further, the character consists of gears and stats you know, and skills. So once you've, been, once you've acquired the character, you want to be able to progress that character even further. And this applies to just about any of the things that you want to sell. So what, I, what I'm trying to say is that at the end of the day, we want to have an right architecture for selling tools, actually. Or the idea is that you know, the more tools and more stuff that you have, uh, the more things that you can sell. So you walk in the department store and you see, if you see like three items on for sale versus you know, having hundreds of different items. Now, this is not so much about monetization, but really it's, it's to do with retention. But since retention is so heavily connected to monetization, and one of the things is that uh, uh, not having stuff to do is the fastest way that you would lose uh, your players. So the idea is to have some, at least one part of your game to be scalable indefinitely. And you don't have to make the whole game scalable, but at least have one feature that would allow uh, the players to continuously play with some form of progression. So a couple of ways we can do this are things this like through endless content. You know, city builders and card, uh, trading card games right, do this very often. Uh, another way is replayable. Uh, this is fairly common in skill-based games and arcade-based games. Now, uh, in more modern ways, more, more modern methods are you know restarts with persistence. Some some of these methods are quite common in idle games today, as well as modern rogue-based games. So the idea is that the player would end the game and restart with something uh, to carry forward. And obviously, there's also PvP evolving meta games. Now, a lot of this stuff are not easy to do, I guess. And uh, uh, but you have to decide, you have to architect for, so, for something like this if you want to have to do a free game. Now, this is a very common problem I've noticed recently among a lot of the developers that I work with is that uh, uh, we tend to look at a couple of games out there in the market and see what's successful, you know, and, and we take those ideas, we see like this idea is pretty cool in this game and you, know, you take it in and you integrate it into the game. So a lot of these approaches are you know, very mechanical or very content in, in, uh, in your approach. But you know, uh, ultimately, it's, it's about having, figuring out your audience, actually. Because when you take a bunch of mechanics you know, and what you think are cool in different games, right, and put it in, you get a fairly uh, confused product, actually. And one of our recent products, or one of the recent products I worked with in, in Wigu had a similar problem. Because we had two different designers at, with two different ideas. Um, so the trick here is to have a mental picture of your player and buyer. And I'm actually, in a sense, echoing some of what the, the, the recent speakers in this, in this event talked about. You know? uh, but, not just, but when you think about the audience, right, uh, what you want to really think about is actually how are they going to be consuming the game? And how are they going to be buying the, the game? So have a mental picture on um, 
how they're going to be playing this game. You know, are they playing this game to unwind? Is it, are they there to relax? Or are they playing it for, you know, for a serious reason? You know, are they looking to invest time? And I think uh, consumption is also one of the best ways that you can differentiate yourself, right, from other types of games. You know, so maybe you might have, uh, might have a serious RPG game. You know, most of the games out there are tailored to have, you know, multiple core loops. But, you know, maybe it's, we are looking for a kind of game that, you know, that has shorter play sessions or, or even cycles of play se uh, sessions that are months in, 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 in time. So be sensitive and understand that it's a lot to do with consumption when, look, when looking at the audience. And also understand the willingness of each audience to spend. So if you imagine a Chinese MMO player versus a Western MMO player, you know, I've had MMO players spend up to you know twenty thousand US dollars a month, and it was quite mind-boggling to me at, <laughs> when that happened. And um, and I've got a lot of people that you know wouldn't imagine spending more than you know thirty, forty dollars on their hobbies. So always uh, root back to your audience, actually. So this this is this is probably something I should have talked about at the earlier stage. Now, um, probably the most important audience that you're going to think about is that is the big spenders, and a lot of times, uh, small developers have a disconnect with these people because you can't imagine, you know, someone spending and putting down, you know, thousands of dollars on your game. So, but the reality is, in most free games, at least even for this region, uh, a large portion, at least 60, 70 percent of your revenue is going to come from a handful of people actually. So get to know them, you know. I when I was running live ops, I used to meet up with some of the players regularly. And I would go, you know, um, um, get to know the community and go partying with them. And then they would blow like, you know, thousands of bucks on parties at night. And it was quite alien to me at that point in time how people would spend money. So get to know them, be comfortable, and understand that not everyone has the same kind of spending habits uh, that you do. Um, have a plan for them. So here's a couple of ideas. You know, one of the things is that let's look at crowdfund. Look at it as don't think of them. You know, the industry likes to talk about big spenders as whales, but you know, think of them as like sponsors in a crowdfunding endeavor. You know, um, we had a game that uh, 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 we had players uh, where we were building the game and 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 we wanted to reward the players actually, uh, and it was, just, it was a trading card game. And one of the things we did was we we, we immortalized play or immortalized contributors right in the game as actual cards in the game. Now it wasn't meant to be a monetization technique, but what happened was that uh, it became fairly uh, uh, popular and had a lot of of our biggest spenders right uh, you know contributing even more to the game. So it, it's kind of interesting what you know people want to do uh, when they want to support your product. I mean, of course, most of us have heard about uh, Star Citizen's success in crowdfunding with 80 million, and there are 2,500 US dollars ships, right, spaceships that sold out in a couple hours. So the idea is that you, you want to think about this uh, audience, these big spenders, and, uh, and so in some cases, you want to you know, treat them as selling luxury goods to these people. Yeah. So, Go with simple things. Sometimes even the simplest things, like you know, re be able to you know rename your characters or changing of our avatars, are some really simple things that you can do. And you know, these people be willing to pay large amounts of money for it. And you know, don't don't limit their spending. I mean, we you know, if someone wants to buy a Louis Vuitton or wants to buy a big you know Maserati, I mean, that's really up to them on how they choose to spend their money. <coughs> so. Now, be generous uh, with your players as well. Uh, so, it's quite—it's kind of funny that because there's a lot of games out there today uh, that try to, you know, uh, coerce or harass your players into buying stuff in the game. Uh, it probably works in the short term, but um, you know, it's, like, it's akin to you walking into a department store and you get uh, this overzealous uh, salesperson, right, uh, trying to sell you stuff. And you know the the natural reaction is to you know move out of the store or, or walk away. So 
don't harass your players, you know, invite them, welcome them and make them like you. I mean, the foundation of any long-term uh, on, uh, uh, online game success, right, or free game success, right, is that you are built, able to build a sustainable community. So give away your content and premium currency. Now, this is one of the things that I struggled with while transitioning from, uh, from uh, live ops into uh, sales or into uh, publishing itself. Um, so we always we always look at players as costs. You know, when they when they're taking out your bandwidth, they're taking up your um, your game master's time in you know tracking issues and logs and stuff. So, but ultimately, their benefits will outweigh their costs. Uh, so they they are basically sources of advertising and content for your game. You know, nobody likes playing in a ghost town, and the more players you have, it actually breeds more players into the game. There are also potential customers down the road. So, um, I mean, let's imagine a college student that just graduated. He may not have disposable income, but you know, three months down the road, with a job, he can now be your customer. And also, you know, user acquisition costs, particularly in mobile today, is so expensive. So, you know, be generous to your players and keep them in your game. Now, all this can only happen, right, if you have an abundance of stuff in your game. So this goes back to having the right architecture of a large amount of things to sell. And so in order to be generous, people always say, you know, give, or give, give stuff. But you can only give stuff if you really have stuff in your game to give out. You know? So you still need to go back and architect for as much as possible in your game. So have lots of tools for the player to buy, you know, and... Uh, layer them, I guess. That's probably the best word I can find now. And finally, if, you know, um, if most of the stuff you know, that I talked about earlier you know, doesn't ring true for you, or uh, it's something that you feel uncomfortable, or something that you think that you, know, you can't achieve with your present resources, you know, then don't go in the middle ground. Don't decide to be you know, half free and half paid. Uh, my my personal experience is, you know, decide to just go paid, and focus on building a good paid product, you know. And with with a paid product, it's back to old school ways of doing stuff. So it's really about the art of self promotion, you know. So if you're more comfortable doing self promotion and doing publicity stuff, uh, just go for a paid game. So and in closing. Um, so I, I'm a pretty much a Western gamer, uh, influence gamer, and I started out doing Chinese MMOs, actually, uh, on a subscription base. And, and this was like in 2002, and in 2004, we, the entire industry has changed in South Asia into a free-to-play uh, market, which was a, a new change as well. And then came browser-based games, and then came social-based games, and now mobile. So like there's this cycle that changes every two years, and and a lot of conceptions and a lot of uh, what we call best practices in the last cycle, you know, would become irrelevant moving forward. You know, so what works today may not work tomorrow. And don't be afraid to experiment, innovate, and make mistakes. Thank you. Big round of applause for my hand. <laughs> I mean, you talked about going paid there. I mean, that's not an idea you hear expressed at Casual Connect very often because of how popular free to play is. And do you think, and you also said at the end there, that every couple of years you see sort of market changes. Do you think we're going to see a shift back where paid becomes a more viable option again? Because user acquisition costs are going up. There's lots of games. I mean, it's hard for developers now to make, make a living out of free-to-play. Yeah, I think that the industry is in a constant cycle. So, but just that the cycles, are, they're just varying degrees of that cycle. So, I mean, I, I do see... A, a desire for paid games to come back. Uh, but free-to-play, I believe, will still be the dominant approach uh, to where the, the big money is going to be. But there's definitely still a large uh, room for paid games to exist in the, in, in the together. Do we have a question from the audience? Okay. Over here at the back. Hello. Oh, okay. Um, thanks for the good talks, uh, Mr. Mohanlo. I'm Nata from App Explorer, and I would like to ask about being generous, like uh, like what you said earlier. 
like you have to like entertain and give the players some of the like premium or premium items or premium currency. Yep. But uh, in another way, like when you do that, you also like does it will affect their purchasing power or will they will be dependent on on that on that system alone or how do you find a balance between like what is the right time to get them into purchasing stuff and when is the right time to give them like free stuff so like like i said the solution really is you you have this problem because when you try to ration what you have so the idea is that you for me was to say that you need to break down your tools right or whatever you have right to be even more parts than what you have that means you what you the problem really is that you just don't have enough stuff to sell and this is very common uh, I work with so many developers is that yeah I've got 13 levels of content you know I've got 40 characters how do I you know convert these 40 characters right into a free to play game that's going to last the next you know 12 months before my next update or whatever it is so the problem is that 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 approach itself right uh, sets you up to be not generous in the game you know so there's no real answer to this i mean but like i said it's it's really about creating as much as possible uh, so break down your car you know break down that uh, break down the character you know gear the gear can have multiple types of sockets you know the character has multiple types of skills so that one tool can you know have multiple dimensions right towards uh, uh, being able to sell so you can once you have so many dimensions you can start you know giving away parts of it but if you don't have enough to give in the first place right it's 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 hard to be generous yeah so um, as a follow-up to that um you talked a little bit about uh catering to your biggest spenders i mean are, are there any rules you would suggest for that because i would say there could be some risk of alienating the people that can't spend that much money. I mean, when you sell someone a $2,000 spaceship, I guess a lot of players might think that's pay to win, you know? So do you have any guidelines for that sort of thing? Yeah, so that really comes down to that audience I talked about. So um, naturally trying to sell, you know, I, we used, in some Chinese MMOs, we used to sell like $2,000 packs of, uh, you know, of gear. And, um, it's not acceptable in certain places and again it's what you're comfortable work do, doing so some games are really designed you know for 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 your for your big spenders uh that's that's a sad the sad part of things but i i think that, that another way you can look at it is like i talked about was you know selling luxury goods it doesn't necessarily need to be paid to win uh so like i mentioned earlier in one, in one of the games that i did was that um we, it didn't start out as a monetization mechanic, you know, where we immortalize players as characters in the game. You know, they're literally uh, some of the cards in the in, in the game, and these players went on to become, you know, our most uh, loyal pl uh, players. You know, after five to six years, they're still in the game, spending, you know, on average a couple hundred dollars a, a month. You know, um, so you talked a lot at the start about creating persistent tools, having mechanics that can scale to infinity. I mean, how much room is there to make mistakes there? How much of that needs to be in place when the game first goes live? Um, obviously, updates and changes are possible in the live environment, but it's quite an unforgiving landscape out there. Yeah. So uh, you, you can latch it on, I guess, at some point. Uh, it's, but it, but in most free games, it's an ongoing process. So this is something that you need to work with the live ops team to continuously improve, right, over time. Uh, but the idea is that 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 there should be some uh, provisioning for a system that will allow uh, the game to scale. 